All right, it's good to see you here today. Glad that you're here with us and uh, pray that God blesses you as uh, looks like we're going to have a hot streak coming in in the next two or three days and that's all right. Uh, we actually have been uh, under 90 for most of this summer. Uh, you wouldn't know it by the people on TV and in the newspaper, but they have their own reasons for yeah. saying all of that stuff. But uh, we have been blessed here with plenty of rain. The grass is green. I know I mowed it yesterday, and it is thick. So God has been blessing, a blessing to us, and we want to give him thanks. And what a better way to do it than come together midweek service and lift up the name of the Lord. Let's continue in worship. All right, let's open up our hymnals to Blessed Be the Name, 206. Blessed be the name. Let's stand and sing.
our scripture reading tonight is Psalm 11. We read through that last Wednesday, and then we'll look at it again tonight, finish it out before we move on. Psalm 11. We'll look at all seven verses, only seven verses in that psalm. Psalm 11. In the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the stream that they may shoot secretly at the upright heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and the burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous, he loves the righteous, his countenance upholds the upright. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. All right, let's sing more about Jesus. Could go both ways. The song title is more about Jesus, so is the sentence. So let's sing 600. Let's stand and sing.
I ask that you bless the offering that we take up now. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. idea, at least, 
When something goes wrong, oh, I wish I could just fly away like a bird. I wish I could get away from the situation I'm in. And whenever I land, I land someplace where the situation is no more. And I can simply live my life freely. Well, you know how this world works. You do get reprieves. Every once in a while, God gives you a break. But the truth of the matter is, is that we would eventually run into another situation. That's just how the world works. So David's determined trust was in the Lord. That was the key to David being an overcomer. And we see that his trust was in spite of developing troubles. He doesn't exactly tell us what the trouble is, but he does give us an illustration in verse 2 and 3. The illustration is that which a warrior would give. Notice in verse 2, for look, in other words, give me your attention. The wicked bend their bow, they make ready their arrow on the string that they may shoot secretly. And here's the key, at the upright in heart. So David is the upright in heart. He's speaking of himself, but he's also speaking of all those that he knows will read this text. In other words, there have been moments in time in which we've gotten what we deserve. In other words, we put ourselves in that trouble, and we're asking God to have mercy upon us because we got ourselves in that trouble, because every one of us have gotten ourselves in trouble. However, he is saying here, what about those moments where I did nothing wrong, and yet here I am? That's what we see here, verse 3. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? David does this from time to time. He'll say to the Lord, uh, Lord, how can I worship you from the grave? In fact, he, he literally says that in the Psalms. And every one of us has said the same things. And it is portrayed prophetically in the life of Jesus Christ. And, and therefore, we understand that not only is this a metaphor, but it's real. That in fact... Jesus gives us hope that even though we die, God will raise us again. And we see that in the hope of the resurrection. And so when we talk about these things, David is, is saying to us, look, God will bring you out of the darkness and into the light, from the grave to life again. He will, in fact, give you strength. David is a walking, breathing testimony through his writings in the Psalms and other places that we see this. Plus, beyond that, Jesus Christ is a testimony that fear can be conquered. What is a greater fear than death? What is a greater? It's the one thing that we can't fix. Even if tomorrow we were to come up with a cure for cancer, all you had to do is Go to Walgreens, CVS, whatever your choice is, Kroger, and get a pill and say, take this pill and the cancer will be gone. Even if you could do that, something eventually will get you. <laughs> That's death. But fear can be conquered because the greatest enemy has been conquered, Scripture says. Jesus conquered it, the grave. Mm -hmm. So his fear was conquered because his trust was in the Lord. That's what we talked about last week. What about this week? The facts are considered. And in those facts, David gives us three questions in verse 4, 5, 6, and eventually 7. He gives us three questions. The first question is this. Where does the Lord sit? Where does the Lord sit is the first question. Verse 4. The Lord is in his where? Holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. In other words... Here is the place and privilege of power for God. The temple speaks of his rightful place in worship amongst those on earth. And heaven speaks to his rightful place of worship amongst the angels in heaven. In other words, David is painting a picture for us that there are two creations. You know that. I've told you that before. God created the angels and he created humans. And he is worshipped by both. And he is also not worshipped by both. That in fact, God will be worshipped both on earth, at Mill Creek Baptist Church and every other church, 
and he will be worshipped in heaven, Isaiah chapter 6. We know that's true. In other words, he will be worshipped in heaven and in earth. Therefore, just as heaven never panics, neither should we as residents of earth. That's the lesson we get, that God is sovereign here and there. That's the point. Where does the Lord sit? He sits on his throne. His throne encompasses both here and there. He is sovereign. Therefore, if you believe he's sovereign, act as you believe he is sovereign. Don't act like Jonah who thought he could run to Tarshish and get away from God. What does the Lord see? That's the second question. It's also in verse 4 and verse 5. His eyes behold his eyelids, test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. The picture of God's eyes here speaks of the narrowing, narrowing of the eyelids, one commentator said, which is what we do when we want to look at something closely, right? In other words, when we want to look at something real closely, I can't see what is exactly. Let me see, what is on Michael's shirt? Uh, oh. Something about the U.S. Army and the ROTC. What did I just do? I squinted my eyes, right, so that I could somehow envision it better. And that's the idea here, is that God is wanting to look very closely into the lives of both those who are good and those who are bad, those who are fallen and those that are redeemed. And the question becomes this then, what is God's desirous of seeing? He is desirous of seeing the trials to come, do the, do the righteous act any different than the wicked. In other words, when... The, notice the point it's building here with David. David is saying, we always ask, why, if I'm ask, working or living righteously, do these things happen to me? Why does the wicked bend the bow, wanting to take out the righteous? And he says, one of the things is, he said, we have to understand the wicked are doing what the wicked do. They act wicked. <laughs> they do what they do. What do you expect of them, right? The dog comes back to his vomit, Christ says, right? But, he says, what God is wanting to see is how you, the righteous, the sons of God and the daughters of God, how you respond to it. How do you respond, not only when you have put yourself in a bad situation, but when you haven't and you suffer as Job righteously? Will you suffer properly? He said, but I don't like that answer. Well, it's too bad. That's what the answer is. The answer is, is that God will put you in positions and allow you to be put into positions in which you will say, but I've done nothing wrong because we still have the mindset of Job's friends. Job's friends blame Job and said, you're this way because you did this or that. And that's an immature way. That's how the world looks at bad things. God's eyes test the righteous, but he denies the unrighteous. In other words, how do you know you're a believer? You will do exactly what Jesus said. Those who endure till the end will be what? Saved, right? How do you know, you've always heard me say, what is the key component to seeing someone as a true believer? They persevere. They endure, even through the difficult times. What does, where does the Lord sit? He sits on his throne. He is sovereign. What does the Lord see? He sees the hearts of the righteous. He already knows what the unrighteous are like. What will the Lord send our way? That's the third question. Verse 6. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone and burning Wind shall be the portion of their cup. The words of David are reminiscent of Lot's family in Sodom and Gomorrah with the coals of fire fell to destroy the wicked. That is the righteous indignation of God. But we also are reminded that in, if a nation or people would repent, such as in this case of Nineveh, he spared them and gave them life. 
In other words, you have God who will punish evil, but you also have a God who will be gracious to those who turn to him. We have both pictures in the Old Testament. We have them also in the New Testament. In the cross, we see that very thing. We see both Sodom and Gomorrah and we see Nineveh. We see the wrath of God poured out on the Son of God, but also we see the grace of God. For the wrath that was poured out on our Lord at the cross was seen in that he was punished for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. All of our sins have been placed upon him. But from the cross, we also find grace. If it were not for the cross, we would not find grace or mercy or salvation or redemption. And so we see them both. What will the Lord send? He will send, in fact, judgment and not only a cup of judgment and wrath, but a cup of grace and mercy. Not only will we get the cup that Christ, we see the cup that Christ took, right, at the cross in the garden, but also the cup that overfloweth in Psalm 23. What have we learned? Let's recap these three questions. The Lord's rule over heaven and earth. The Lord will test men to see what they are made of. And third, as with all tests, some will fail and some will pass. God's divine sovereignty is seen in the first test. His divine tests are seen in the second. And God's divine decision is seen in the third. We can't cheat God. We can cheat men, but we can't cheat God. We can fool men, but we can't fool God. There was a guy many years ago, many years ago before they had instant replay in Major League Baseball, there was a guy named Al Shat. He slid into second base, and something amazing happened that almost never happens. As he slid into the base, the baseball was thrown by the catcher toward the shortstop who was coming over to cover so he could swipe and tag him out. And when Shaq came back up on second base, everyone was looking around, and they could not find the ball. Shaq all of a sudden realized the ball was in his pocket. But no one knew it. The ball had been thrown, and somehow it had gone into his pocket. Everybody, the center fielder, the second baseman, the shortstop, the umpire, everyone was looking for the ball. Shaq took off. He went to third base, and then he went to home plate. And he was celebrating, knowing that he had scored a run and pulled it over. But when he came back out to celebrate, the ball fell out of his pocket. He was disqualified, thrown out of the game, and fined, and the run was not counted. <laughs> so you can fool some men, but you can't fool God. One person put it this way. We cannot cheat God. His test will come our way. The ones who pass the test will be those who live with integrity and character. God is in his holy temple, and God is in heaven watching us closely. So we've seen the two components of this text. We see David's fear is conquered. We also see the facts that are considered through the three questions. And then finally, in the seventh verse, we see his faith being confessed. This is often what David does at the end of his psalm. Look at verse 7. The Lord is righteous. That's his conclusion. The Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance, or his face, is turned and beholds the upright. So, again, here's two questions. What does David know? He knows what we know. God is good and he hates evil. I mean, we can teach that to children, can't we? I mean, we, we could teach that to a five-year-old, and it would be a great lesson, wouldn't it? Why can't we teach it to ourselves? We're grown-ups. God loves righteousness, but he hates evil. He loves what is good. He hates what is evil. The second thing is why do we have this faith? That's the second question. Why do we have faith? This faith, we have it because goodness will prevail. Goodness will prevail. 
And it comes down to the same thing we talked about a while ago. It's why, G, why, why the psalmist says God squints his eyes to see and inspect the hearts of men and women. We have to ask ourselves, do we believe God is the ultimate sayer of what's right and what's wrong? Do we believe that God will one day judge good and evil, the righteous and the unrighteous? See, that's where it comes down to, because many people lose their faith, so, so to speak. They become apostate on the very issue. And it's often not when they're looking at other things. In other words, they can, they can look at your life and see you going through difficulties, and a lot of them won't lose their faith. They'll just say, that's sad. And they may mean it. But then when that same dilemma, when the bow is bent toward them, they'll look at themselves when it comes to their life, and they'll say, why me? And my question is always this. Why didn't you say that when you were watching everyone else go through the same thing? In other words, imagine yourself in their position. That's called empathy. When you look at someone else going through difficulty, feel the same way as if you were going through the same difficulty. Why do we have this faith? We have this faith to prove that righteousness prevails. The reason our movies have happy endings and our fairy tales have happy endings and our plays that we watch on stage have happy endings, I believe, is because within us not only is a fallen heart but also an image of God. In other words, we are both fallen and we still carry an aspect of the image of God. And that's why what you, you notice used to, you had happy endings all the time in the movies. And now more and more you don't see the happy endings. And the reason that is, is because what you're seeing is a tilt. A tilt away in our culture from that which God has placed within our hearts, and that is the image of God. We desire hope. That's what a happy ending is. A happy ending. We realize that in most, most circumstances or many circumstances in life, we don't have happy endings. But we write happy endings in because hope lives within us. What happens when hope leaves a culture? When hope leaves the culture, we start looking dark. We start running away from the light. Don't run from God when danger comes. Run to him. When you see darkness on the horizon, run to the light. Be in the light, not in the darkness. I was reading about a well-known author who had written several biographies. He had written a biography on Teddy Roosevelt, on Ronald Reagan, on several presidents. And on his vacation, he and his dad were in the jungle. And of course, if you know anything about the jungle that is different from our cities, is that it's very dark in the jungle. <laughs> it's not like the cities where light is everywhere. But him and his dad were staying in a stand-up tent, you know, the kind that you would see on a safari or something like that. And there was no light, and they had turned all the lights off, and they had turned on Mozart. And there they were in the middle of this great jungle, in the midst of the dark, like being in a cave. They could not even see the stars, for they were inside the tent. And there they were, complete and absolute darkness. Utter darkness, get that. No light whatsoever. Listening to Mozart's symphonies. <laughs> and there they sat, and then they heard something. And they thought, well, I'll just walk over there. But then his dad said, no, turn on the light. You may trip over something. Sure enough, he goes ahead and he turns on the light. Thank goodness. For a little creature had crawled into their tent. They looked down, and about five feet in front of him at the door of the tent was a king cobra. <laughs> Who knew cobras were attracted to Mozart? <laughs> 
But what was the issue? Not that there was danger. They were in the middle of the jungle. There is danger in the middle of the jungle. The issue is, is that they could not see the danger because they had no light. The issue for us is this. We're in a fallen world. There will be danger. There will be moments when, in fact, the enemy will bend their bow and they will take out the, uh, the righteous if they can. There will be moments when in the midst of darkness, we will get scared and we'll want to run from the light, not realizing that at the door of the tent, danger lurks. You might step right on it. But if you run to the light, you'll see the danger and avoid it. Don't run from God when things go bad. Run to the light. Let's stand. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for your love and your grace and your much kindness. Lord God, we ask that you would take this time when we've looked at this precious psalm, Psalm 11, and we've seen that David has taught us, don't run from God when everything in you wants to say, God, why in the world did you let this happen? Why, if I'm your child, if, if you've truly given me promises of hope, why has darkness overcome my life? Why do bad things happen to good people? Father, we come to you in this asking, Father, that sometimes when you don't get answers to those questions, just remember this. Run to the light not into the darkness. Thank you, Father. Even though not every answer comes to us, the ultimate answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 203. 203. church and in the life of our people. So let's end in a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Brother Ben, will you dismiss us? Oh Lord, we thank you for this day that we're able to come and hear your word. Lord, we thank you for the fortress and the protection that you are, that you provide us, Lord. We know that uh, the arrows may come our direction, but we know that you are good and that you will see us through. That you will preserve that which needs to be preserved. We pray you go with us as we go out from this place. Check us through the rest of the week and give us ways and opportunities for our <laughs> to glorify your name, in which we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.